This training is being recorded. As you know, we are putting these up. Julie works feverishly to get these up on our PD page as, as trainings. So, so you know that. As we work through this, please feel free to interrupt us, ask questions as they come up. If we're moving too quickly, please feel free to let us know that. This is your training. We want it to be useful for you. So please feel free to let us know what you need as we move throughout. We are going to have several check, chat box check-ins. So if your question doesn't get answered that way, just let us know. So this is a data collection. We're gonna talk about that. And here is the team. My name is Colette Sullivan. I am the Federal Programs Coordinator and I work with this exceptionally talented team. We are responsible primarily for the supervision and monitoring across the state, but we also do, as you know, a lot of professional development, a lot of TA, and uh, we're happy to be here with you guys today. I would like to ask the rest of my team to just come on real quickly and introduce themselves. Leora, could you do that, please? Hi, I'm Leora Byrus. I'm a former special education teacher at an SPPS, and I joined the Department of Education almost five years ago. Great, thank you, Jennifer. Hello, I am Jennifer Gleason. I too was a special education teacher, functional life skills, before I joined the department two years ago. Thank you, Carly. Hi, I'm Carly Thibodeau. Um, I am the newest member of the team. I joined last July, so I'm just coming up on one year. And um, before that, I was an educator for 21 years. And Julie. I'm Julie Pelletier. I'm the admin support for this fabulous team. Um, I've been here about six and a half years. And prior to that, I was admin support in a K-5 elementary school for 16 years. Thank you, guys. Um, I have to apologize to all of you. We have been on the road furiously for the past couple of weeks. I am a little, we call it spicy. I'm a little spicy today. Um, and we also had it brought to our attention that these pictures, the snake pictures make people uneasy. So, so if you're one of those people, let me apologize. We're, 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 gonna, we're gonna work on getting some new team photos up. Well, I don't think it was uneasy. I believe it was nauseous. <laughs> Yes, the, the, the snake pictures, for those people who don't like snakes, our apologies. So here is our contact information. If you have questions, comments, if you are looking for feedback on um, IEPs or eligibility forms, if you're looking for some feedback, feel free to reach out to us for feedback. Our guidance around that feedback would be Keep it very generic, do not attach it, do not make it child specific. We wanna support you, but if we see specific IEPs, then we have to look at it through the lens of uh, monitoring and supervision. And that's a very, different, a very different presentation. So here's our contact information. We'd love to hear from you. This is our newsletter. We are in the process of putting this together. Leora has worked very hard on this. We are hoping to get this out quarterly. This is a QR code that you can use with your phone if you're interested in, in, in getting this newsletter. We are not gonna send it out to people unless they request it. There's also a link. So either one you can access, whichever one is easiest for you. Procedural manual is here and is Muser. And both of these documents have been dropped into the chat box and they are both documents that we talk about a lot. Procedural manual is an especially helpful document. A lot of what we will talk about through all of our professional developments, if you go back to the procedural manual, it will go into quite a bit more detail around anything that we discuss. If you don't have this document, it would be really good for you to download it and, and just have it available. All right, data collection. So we get a lot of questions about data collection and we do have a lot of PowerPoints around data collection, but for today, we really wanted to kind of um, broaden the scope of what we've done in the past and really just make it a little bit more open-ended as opposed to very specific. So data collection really is all about information and decision-making. Those are really the important things that you need to be able to do with data, right? It's important to be able to track academic behavior and, and use that information to determine whether or not your programming is working. It needs to be systematic and intentional data. It should not be something that you sort of take one day and then you sort of take another day. 
you really have to have a plan around how you're going to collect data and how you're going to use data. And you really want to consider that whenever you're making um, decisions or you know, especially around programming, it's really important to really use your data in a way that is going to drive all of your programming decisions. So if you've joined us for any of our data collection series in the past, you know that there are multiple ways that you can collect data, multiple data um, points, multiple data systems. So the thing that you would really want to start with is just think about, well, what is it that I want to track? Is it academic? Is it functional? Where do I want to start? And then it's really important to very clearly define that so that everybody knows exactly what you're looking for so that everybody can identify that behavior or that academic skill in exactly the same way. From there, it's important to choose a data collection system. And we can talk a little bit more about that. You know, there are some um, skills or behaviors that you might use, you know, tallying. There are others that you might wanna look at duration. So you have to really think about, this is the skill of the behavior, so this is the data system. Taking data all day long would be really challenging. So think about when would it make the most sense to collect data? You don't wanna overwhelm yourself. If you know that the child is really struggling during a particular time of day, maybe it's circle time, then maybe you just wanna start out by focusing on circle time so that you can really try to tease out exactly what's going on during that time. You know, lunch is really something that the child does well at. Don't worry about taking data at lunch. Summarizing and or graphing the data is really helpful. Personally, I never graphed data. It just, it just wasn't something that was important to me. However, graphing is a really great way to show data in a very visual way, especially for parents, so that they can really see data in a way that is very, very clear. And then the biggest thing is to really make sure, again, that you use that data to make decisions about program effectiveness. So for me, it's really about taking data, summarizing it and analyzing it, and then using it to determine programming. So if I were to select the skill and describe it, it's really, really, again, that definition is so important. So you wanna make sure that you define it in descriptive words so that anyone can clearly identify the target. And I know I used to create data sheets you know, at home when I was putting my curriculum together or whatever, doing my, my planning. And in my mind, I'm like, yeah, that makes perfect sense. I get it. And I would often go into class and put a data sheet down in front of somebody and they saw it completely different. We don't want that to happen. You want to make sure that they see, you know, your ed techs, whoever is looking at that data sheet sees it exactly the way you do. Otherwise, you're not going to get what you want to get. If you're looking to reduce a behavior, it's really important to identify and teach that replacement behavior. Because if you don't give the student a replacement behavior, they will replace it themselves and they might replace it with something that is even less efficient. So instead of just telling a student hands down, what do you want them to do with their hands? Help them identify what they should do instead of telling them what not to do. So make sure that when you're defining it, that it's easily observed, it's countable, it has a clear beginning and ending, and you can identify very clearly when and where under what conditions that behavior occurs. So again, really thinking about when am I going to take data and why am I taking data during that time? So if you know, again, that the target behaviors are happening during a particular point of day, that's when you're going to want to, to try to get that information. So our example here, if I know as a teacher that it's important for me to collect data on math performance, maybe I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do that during and after a session because that behaviors might be, it might be more important during that time to take a look at my behaviors, okay? So just try to think about what you're looking at and when it makes sense to do that. Then you wanna choose a system. There are lots and lots of different systems, but you really want to think about which one is going to gather the information that you're hoping to gather and then implement it. So as a teacher, it's really important to determine your data schedule. And remember that that consistent collection is going to tell the best story. 
that data analysis is so important. I, you know, you it it doesn't matter if you take exceptionally strong data, if you put it in a notebook and you put the notebook on the shelf and you never do anything with it. Or worse, if you put it in the notebook and then you pull it out at progress monitoring and use it only then. Your data is something that would be best to be looked at all the time. I used to look at my data sheets. Best practice for me was every day. I didn't always get to them every day, not gonna lie. But I mean, I looked at them several times a week and really tried to use them to, to figure out what I was doing next. Inter-observable, inter-observer reliability is good practice. And my ed techs in my classroom could tell you that that was something I talked a lot about wanting to do. We never really had a lot of chance to do that. But if you have the opportunity to have two observers sit and observe and record the same behavior of the same student at the same time for that reliability piece, that's really, really good training. That's really important. And if there's time to do that, there's so much learning that can be done in that. And then summarizing and graphing. Like I said, I didn't graph it. I kept percentages, but graphing is, it's so meaningful for parents. So for those of you who do graph data, hats off to you. It's, I think it's really great because raw data, it, it doesn't mean anything. It just doesn't mean anything. If you go to an IEP meeting and you say the child exhibited this behavior 14 times, that doesn't mean anything in and of itself. You need to make sure that the data you're collecting really is transferable into a meaningful way and makes sense to the parents as well as the team. And you really want to make sure that it shows the information you're trying to relate to your team. This is one way that you can summarize and graph data. It just talks about calculating the percentage of correct responses so that you can get a, a percentage for this. And this is just another example. And here's a third. So this for me is the most important part about data. When you talk about data, it really, if you're not gonna use it to determine program effectiveness, then don't take data. Ooh, that, that hurts me. Or as Jennifer would say, that makes me sweaty. If you're not gonna use data to, to really determine whether or not your program is good, then why are you taking data at all? It doesn't matter. So really data should be continuous. It should be ongoing. You really want to tear your data apart and look for trends. Is this child always exhibiting this behavior right before the bus comes? Is this child always exhibiting this behavior when this person walks in the room? What is going on and how can I help this child feel better in this moment? You want to really look for increases or decreases in performance. I used to look for trends of three or more. So that's up for you to determine. Data trends, again, program effectiveness. And if your programming isn't working, you want to figure out how you can change and make it better. I feel like I am going really, really fast. So let's just take a pause here and see if there are any thoughts or questions or if anybody has anything they want to jump on and say, or if there's anything in chat, can you guys let me know? There's nothing in chat right now. Nothing in chat. Am I moving too quickly? Is everybody feeling okay? No. All right, then let's keep going. All right. So quantitative data versus qualitative data. So qualitative is very descriptive and quantitative is really about numbers, quantities, and values. So when you think about that analysis, Qualitative can be more difficult to analyze because you can't really reduce that to numbers or calculations. So you could reduce that down into themes, but that would really be pretty challenging and you might find a lot of outliers, but it's really not, it, you're not gonna get the percentages that are easily, easily defined. Quantitative can be ranked and, and defined more easily. So let's take a look at this. So you've got 13 trees in a six acre area. The birds in the six acre area are blue, red, and yellow. So if you look at it in a quantitative way, you know that there are 13 trees, right? That's, that's very clear. Qualitative, 
there are blue, red, and yellow birds. So you can just see how one gives you very clear, precise information and one's a little bit less so. So if I wanted to convert this information, we would just define that, right? So how many red birds are there in the six acre area? How many blue birds, how many yellow birds? So it just helps you define it a little bit more closely so that when you're thinking about your data collection, when you're thinking about your data reporting, think about making sure that you can define this in a way that really makes sense to everybody and gives everybody the most information possible. So why is this important? Well, again, so that it supports that movement through the IEP. We talk a lot in some of our other um, professional developments about that Andrew F, that Supreme Court case. So that is something that we really, that we really tie back to um, data a lot. If you have good data, if you're analyzing your data, you're going to know what your programming looks like and you're going to be able to move forward with it. So really thinking about those goals, they have to be data driven. So let's look at Sammy the cat, okay? So look at Sammy. In the chat box, tell us some qualitative data that you, that you can identify about Sammy. Just take a peek at him. And if you would, in the chat box, just tell us qualitative data that you can identify about him based on this picture. And there's no right or wrong answer, obviously. Anybody want to share? You can even come on and share or somebody wants to read the chat box. So we so far we've got that there's black and he has black and white fur. He has white whiskers and yellow eyes. He has two eyes, two ears. Awesome. Fantastic. Okay. You got it. Right. Exactly. So here we go. He's black and white all over except for his paws, chest, chin, part of his tummy, which is white. His hair is short to medium in length. He spends most of his day asleep and tends to go out at night. I'm not really sure that that's accurate. I don't know that we can get that information from this picture, but he's sitting on a brown rug. So there's some information. So how about quantitative? Make up some quantitative data about Sammy, because obviously we don't. So he sleeps for 23.5 hours a day. <laughs> like my cat. <laughs> His head tilts to the right four times a day. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Mine could, for one of my cats, could be they walk back and forth in front of the uh, computer 48 times a minute. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Awesome. Okay. So his tail is 30 centimeters. He weighs five kilograms. So you can see... Um, you know, more of a quant more quantitative examples and yours were far more interesting than these. So thank you for sharing those. Great. Okay, anything in chat box, any questions or anybody wanna come on with anything? You doing all right? There are no questions in chat. All right, great. All right, so without data, you're just another person with an opinion, right? So if you're like, I think the child falls apart during recess or the child seems to have a hard time at lunch. You know, whenever we talk to people about IEPs, we always say, get rid of seems to or often or, or appears to get rid of that. Replace that with your, Jennifer always says, trust your data. So get rid of those seems to and make sure that you're replacing that with your data. So frequency or rate recording and event recording are two specific types of data systems. And frequency is defined as the number of responses per unit of time, right? An event encompasses a wide variety of procedures for detecting and recording the number of times a behavior of interest occurs. So when would we use these? These would best be used if the behavior has a clear beginning and end so that you can clearly tell 
when the behavior starts and when it ends and when there's enough time in between to distinguish that start and end point. You would only use this if the behavior is one that can be easily counted and if the intent is to increase or decrease a behavior, okay? You would not use frequency or event if it happens at such a high rate that it would be really hard to keep track of it. Like if the child is, is tapping their pencil, you know, that tap, 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 tap. You would not want to have to sit there and count one, two, three, four. That just wouldn't make sense. Or if the behavior ex occurs for extended amount of time, like a tantrum. So why would I choose this? What are the advantages? So it gives you that quantitative measurement where you can think about what am I going to use to, to put in some of those replacement behaviors? What are the pieces I'm going to use to, to change? It gives you a quick record, just tallies, okay? It's useful for those quantitative measures. The disadvantages is it's, it's that raw data. And remember I said that raw data by itself is not terribly useful. Like if you wanna talk about how many times the child walks away from their desk to walk into an IEP meeting and say the child walks away from their desk 32 times, that in and of itself is not useful. So just keep that in mind. It only measures one kind of data and makes it highly selective and can be restrictive. And it can allow the recorder's bias to enter the recording. So again, walking away from the desk. Well, if the child stands up and they lean away from their desk, is that walking away? You know, those types of things. You want to really think about that. So what might be some examples? Task initiation, right? That's pretty easy to demonstrate. That's pretty easy to see when it starts. We know where we are with that. Correct and or incorrect academic responses. You see that all the time, like with those mad minute sheets, those types of things. If the student is tardy, if they leave seat, if they're interrupting, requesting help, praising, littering. So you can see when you look at these examples, some of these are examples of behaviors I would want to decrease. So like leaving seat during class or interrupting. But then some of these are also behaviors that I might track because I want to increase, right? like task initiation or requesting help. So you could use these both ways. So don't, don't lose sight of that. So if I am looking at, at tracking data on hitting, again, it's really important to make sure that I've clearly defined hitting. I want everybody who's in my classroom who's responsible for data collection. My last classroom, I had 13 students and 13 ed techs, so I couldn't be everywhere. It was really important for my ed techs to know exactly what I meant when I said, I want you to track how many times this student hits. So you define it. Hitting is defined as any occurrence of making contact with any part of another person's body with an open or closed hand from a distance of six inches or more. Oftentimes it's really helpful to include what we call non-examples. It just helps clarify that a little bit more. And in this case, we included non-examples as giving a high five or other common social interaction. So if I walk up to you and I tap you on the shoulder, or even if maybe if the child does it with an open hand, it's not considered a hit. Now, defining your, your behaviors would really be child specific. This hitting definition may not be an appropriate hitting definition for another child. Okay, this is just what we used for this particular example. You might have a child that hits and the way they hit, it looks very different. So just keep that in mind as well. You can see on this data sheet, which looks so lovely, and I can promise you that none of my data sheets in my classroom ever looked like this. We have the dates along the left. We have the setting or the activity because as I've mentioned a couple of times, I wanna know where the behavior is happening, the length of the observation, and then the total number of times that that behavior occurred. So if you look at this, drop in the chat box for me what you think, what your hypothesis is for this student in hitting, just based on this one, this one data sheet. What do you think this one data sheet might tell you? And if it's easier for people to just come off mute and just talk to us, that's great too. If, you, if you're comfortable doing that, I'd love that. Something's going on at lunch. Something's going on at lunch. I, why would you say that? That's where most of the data is coming from is during lunchtime. 
Absolutely. I agree. I agree completely. We see music. There's no, there's not no hitting going on. There's no hitting going on during art. There's that one day where there was only one during lunch, but yeah, lunch, lunch seems to be a biggie. So if I move on, you know, we're going to have to keep that in mind. So here's a different one, different way to do it. We have interrupting talking out of turn. So again, we've defined it. Defined as any vocalization that is not teacher initiated and is disruptive to others out of turn or unrelated to academic comment. Non-examples, socially appropriate statements like excuse me, thank you or similar. So we did this one a little bit different in this example. We just tracked the date and the instances. Which one do you think gives you more, more um, information? One that's set up like this or one that's set up like this? What do you think? The one that includes the setting and activities or the one that does not? Someone wrote first chart. So the yeah. one with the setting and activity. Yeah, I would agree. And this, if I was using this data sheet, you know, I might have this a couple over, you know, I've got it over several days. I'm probably not going to bother taking too much data in art or music class moving forward. I'm really going to dig into lunch a little bit. Okay. So here's just another example. So if you're looking to record this, it's really, really important to track the date. You could write either the time period. So if you know like lunch is always 11 to 11.30, you could just write lunch. You could write the time, whatever makes the most sense to you. A lot of times, um, you know, if you know that you're gonna watch that, just write that in ahead of time, make it as easy as possible. Tally every time the behavior occurs and then just include the total. This is just another example. If you Google data sheets, there are millions and millions and millions of examples. So these are just a lot of different examples that we pulled just to show you. So this one is correct responses in math class. Okay, so you can see we've got the dates. We know we're only looking in math class. We know that's 10 to 1030. So you can see how the child did across these four days. So again, this information, these several data sheets that we just shared, in and of themselves mean nothing, right? You have to really think about what's next. And these are all just blank examples, okay? And again, if you Google data sheets, if you Google frequency data sheets or you know event, you'll get millions of them. These are just some helpful tips if, um, you know, cause people, you know, I, I can't carry around a data sheet. My hands are full or, I, you know, I was, I was, famous for putting it down and having no idea where I put it. That was, that was, you know, me, um, you know, the, these are things that you could try, you know, a clicker. We, we, we used to use a clicker, um, small objects in your pocket. So, you know, something, it could be, it could be coins. It could be, you know, elastics, it could be whatever. So you start out with 10 in your left pocket. And when the child does the thing that you're tracking, you move it to the other side, just something simple like that beads on a pipe cleaner. Um, you know, technology, there are millions of apps out there. So, and lots of kids have iPads. We all, you know, we have iPhones, you know, most of us have phones that are compatible with some of these apps. You could certainly do something like that. Um, elastics on your fingers, you know, put it, move it from finger to finger to track that. So those are just some examples. Does anybody have other examples that they use that they find to be helpful that aren't included here? Anything they want to come on and share? No. If anybody thinks of anything, I'd love to. I'd love to hear it. Okay. So I've only said about seven million times that collecting the data is not enough. It's really important to summarize it and analyze it, right? So frequency at the end of the observation, uh, you want to really total that number of occurrences. So you know, Anna left her seat five times during seventh period. For rate. You're gonna count the number of times the behavior occurred during the time that that child was observed when you were looking for that behavior. And then you're going to divide that by the length of time. So Anna kicked a pier 30 times in a 10 minute observation, the weight rate would be three kicks per minute. Okay, you can see the math there. When you're trying to figure out how you're going to summarize data, keep it as simple as possible. Do things in groups of 10 if you can, You know, just try to think about creating a data sheet where you might have the, um, 
the prompts, if you will, already prepared on the data sheet. So people just have to circle or cross off or something. Try to make it as easy as possible so that you're not having to do too much work in the moment. And remember that a frequency should only be used when the length of the op observation time is consistent from day to day. So if you're trying to measure a time, if you're trying to measure a behavior and you're measuring it at 10 minutes here and then 20 minutes here, you're going to get apples to oranges. And then the rate measure should be used if the length can vary. So just trying to think about when each one of those might make the most sense. Questions in chat? There's nothing in chat. Okay. All right, duration. So duration, I think, is easier. And um, Jennifer and I worked together, and man, we, we had a, a student that we measured duration on for so many different things, and we used to have, you know, clickers going all over the place. Um, but duration is the total extent of time in which a behavior occurs. And you can look at that in two ways, total duration per session or total duration per, or duration per occurrence. So total duration per session is the measure of the cumulative amount of time in which a person engages in that behavior. So you're gonna look at that in a, in a, in a, in a whole, whole way versus the measure of the duration of time that each instance occurs. So let's look at this in a little bit more hands-on way. So make sure that you have some kind of a timing instrument available. It could be something as simple as a stopwatch, or again, we all have access to phones. If you're a teacher, if you're a teacher and you allow your staff to use, you know, the timers on their phones, great. Make sure that that is consistent and document date, time the behavior began, when it stopped, and then you're going to calculate that, that length of time. So some good Examples that you might want to consider using duration recording for would be crying, attention to tasks, reading a book, writing in class, out of seat behavior, time on task, which is the same as attention to task. I guess we just really wanted to hit that one. Screaming, yelling, or rocking. So these are things that you would not want to measure, again, with a tally, because if the child cries, you know, three times and you tally three cries, but the each time they cry, they, it lasts two hours, you're not getting a real clear sense, right? So you really want to look at duration for that type of an example. So you would use this when you want to measure how long a behavior lasts. And when that behavior has a very clear beginning and ending, and again, some clear consistent timing instrument, and this is what you would use if the behavior doesn't happen often, but when it does happen, it tends to last for a longer period of time. And again, like, like with the other behaviors, that those behaviors that we want to either decrease or increase, that would be the same here. So we might be measuring behaviors that are too long, like crying, or too short, like attention to task. So you would be using it on both, on both ends. And then as we did with the others, we have some examples of potential data sheets. So that was the first one was a blank one. And then this here, we there's a clear definition of what working individually means. So sitting at a desk with an assignment, looking at the assignment, not talking to peers. Once the student looks up, not looking at the assignment anymore, the behavior has stopped. If the student begins talking to peers while looking at assignment, behavior has stopped. So they've clearly defined this as in such a way so that you, you can clearly start and stop that timer to look at how long that child is attending to pass. This is an example of one, like I said, if you can create a data sheet where you have as much information already sort of pre-populated as possible, this is a good example of that because you already have a blank for the date, you have a blank for the start and the end time. So it just gives you a really quick, you can just boop, really quickly fill that information in the description of the target behavior is up at the top. So measure of the duration of time, each instance occurs. So each time a student leaves their seat, the teacher starts a stopwatch. When the student returns, the teacher stops the stopwatch and then that time is recorded. So that is, they're looking at that duration for the student out of seat. And you could repeat that throughout. So here's what this might look like. So we have the behavior defined, leaving seat. 
any instance in which child is at least one foot away from his desk or seat any time after the lesson has started. So this includes times when he has asked but was not given permission to leave. So if the child, you know, asks to go to the bathroom or asks to, you know, leave the room for and you say yes, that's fine, then obviously that's not that doesn't count in the data. But if he asks to leave the room and you say no and he leaves the room, that's that counts, right? So you can, you can see we've got the dates along the left, the observation period, so the classes as well as the times, <clears throat> and then the amount of time that the child is away from their seat for each one of those activities. And it looks again like maybe math is a challenge, okay? So total duration per session is a little bit different. Again, that measures the cumulative amount of time that a person engages in the behavior. So in this example, the teacher is concerned that a kindergarten student spends too much time playing alone. So during free play, the teacher starts their stopwatch whenever the child engages in solitary play. When they engage with the peers, the teacher stops the timer but does not reset it. So they're going to run this for the total duration, okay? And they're going to manage it that way so that they will have total duration at the end of that activity. And you can see how that might look for this student. Any instance in which the child engages in solitary play, non engaging with peers, can include solid uh, parallel play. Okay. And then just some more examples. And these are pre populated. When you're thinking about data collection, no matter what the data collection system is, it's really, really, really important to remember intensity, which is the force in which a behavior occurs because the intensity of a behavior can really um, impact the duration. And you want to make sure that you adjust that ac accordingly. So pay very close attention to extreme or intense behaviors. I'm, I, that's okay, thank you. Okay, so really think about that intensity. So for example, if a child is engaged in tantrum behavior and you say, oh, well, they only tantrumed for five minutes, that's not a big deal. But the tantrums included, you know, self-injurious behaviors or headbanging or extreme aggression. Well, that is a big deal. That intensity is huge. And you want to really make sure that your data captures, captures the intensity as well as the duration. So make sure that that is something that you keep in your head all the time. Outcomes. We were on site today and we were talking, well, we talk about outcomes a lot. Outcomes are hard. And outcomes are that distinctly and the outcomes are the the things that we want all students to be able to do those age appropriate expectations and we cannot guarantee outcomes okay outcomes for some examples of outcomes would be like we want the child to attend we want the child to um, finish their work we want the child to not be aggressive those types of things those are things that we want for all of our students. And we don't want to write goals around outcomes. We want to write goals around our distinctly measurable and persistent skill gaps that are interfering with the child's ability to reach those outcomes. Now, if you've joined us for any PD, we've talked a lot about outcomes. But again, it's really, you really need to use your data collection to help you think about what those skill deficits might be to avoid those outcome based goals. On an IEP, data is necessary. It is an IDEA mandate to be in the present level. So we have an academic goal here. By June 10th, 2020, given a variety of inset puzzles and specially designed instruction, child will demonstrate mastery of five inset puzzles with 100% mastery across three consecutive presentations as measured by data collection, teacher observations, work samples, or similar blah, 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 right? So you can see that our present level really aligns to this goal, right? We've got our clear present level where the student is currently able to do two inset puzzles. We want them to be able to do five inset puzzles so that that data is where you, you've collected that data. That data is really important. And that's that academic data, which is a little bit different than some of the behavior pieces we've talked about, but it's just as important. This is an example of a data sheet that I used to keep. Um, it is, it's just one that I use. So I'm not recommending that you do or do not use it. It's just what I use. So this is an example of a child who was using an inset number 
puzzle. Um, and you can see that he, that the student mastered it on 5-8 as evidenced by the three 100s across the top. So there were their three consecutive sessions. So it was mastered on 5-8. And here's a different one. So I knew that they had mastered a couple of different puzzles. So this was just the way that I chose to keep data. But however you choose to keep data, just make sure that you have the data sheets and you have the data to support whatever your progress monitoring tells you. So functional is the same thing. You would need to have that present level data in your functional goal as well. So we have this example by June 10th, 2020, given prepared daily visual schedule and SDI, student will follow task analysis to transition through all activities in the day with 80% mastery across three consecutive opportunities as measured by data collection, observation, work samples or similar, right? So we're teaching the child to follow a schedule as opposed to writing a goal that says the child will attend school. So you've got the goal, you've got the present level with data in it, and you've got your data sheets, okay? So you can see how the child did, you can see when it was mastered, okay? So again, just supporting your, your goals, with that progress monitoring piece as it aligns to present level to goals all the way through. So if I have Joanne here and we want her to increase her defiant behavior to two or few episodes per day, does that sound like outcome to you? What do you think? Is that something we want for all students to have a day that doesn't have any defiance? Think so? So we, yes, I mean, it, it is. We would not want to write a goal around reducing defiance because we want all students to come to school and operate in a way that doesn't include defiance, right? So why is Joanne defiant? Why does she not have the skills? Why does she lack skills that result in her being defiant? And these are some other examples like attendance, work completion, attention to task, reducing reducing aggressions or tantrum behaviors. I've told this story a hundred times. I'm sorry if you've heard me say it. When I joined the department about five years, almost five years ago, every single one of my functional goals was outcome. Every single one of them, I was doing them incorrectly. And I, I had no idea because I was writing goals like the child will reduce aggressions the child will reduce tantrums. Every single one of my goals, I was not including in my goals the things that I was trying to teach the child, and that's what I should have focused on. So instead of Joanne will reduce instances of defiant behavior, I wanted instead to think about those skill deficits and write the goal around that. So instead, Joanne will request help. Joanne will request a break. Joanne will use a visual schedule to transition throughout her day, those types of things, okay? So those are some of the skills. So providing the student with some biweekly probes in alignment with their goals can help you get some good solid data. You do not have to track data every day. I know that data can be really overwhelming. I am a self-professed data nerd. I love it. I love everything about it. I love the creation of data sheets. I love taking data. I love tracking it. I love analyzing it. I love, I love all of it. And I know that I'm kind of loopy that way. But for those of you who, who aren't, and that's fine, you don't have to take it every day. But you should take it in such a way that you get the information that you need and can really use that information to support what you're telling the IEP team, okay? You wanna make sure that everything is consistent when you're administering those probes to make sure that the data is accurate and it's true. And if you want, have the student graph their own data. Not only does that give them some insight into their goals and their IEP and help them do maybe some buy-in into what they're working on, it's kind of fun, they love it, it's motivating. Have kids do that. Keep those data sheets consistent with each type of reading and or math probe. You would not want to change your data sheet from, you know, data sheet A to data sheet B midway through. You might change how it's how it's being recorded and, and analyzed. Stay true to the schedule and graph data to make it more parent and IEP team friendly. So remember, it's it's information, 
experience and knowledge, which helps make decision and it drives programming. And again, if you're not using it to drive programming, you're really wasting your time. So although not everyone collects data, everyone should be looking at it and considering it when developing programming. The district I was in before I joined the department, we used to have team meetings every Wednesday. And I mean, I would bring my data. And although there was data that we would talk about that was not necessarily related service provider data, we still would all talk about it. Like, well, what do you, what did you see around this? And that would help the discussion. And it would give, you know, related service providers a lot of information about different things that they might want to consider. So even though it was my data and it was specific to some of the information, some of the things that I was doing, it really helps drive their programming as well. So data-driven decisions and strategies, keep it data-driven. Talked about this, program effectiveness, what does the data tell you, what needs to change and how are you gonna do that? And this is that Andrew F case that I touched on briefly. We've talked a lot about it. This is a YouTube link um, that you can, it's, I don't even remember now. I think it's like four or five minutes long and it's just a little blurb that will go into a little bit more detail. And this is a, a document from the USDOE. It is six or seven pages long and it's a Q&A document and it is very good. I like it a lot because it really a asks and answers a lot of questions about the Andrew F case. And it's really helpful because it'll give you a nice sense of why this case is so important, why the Supreme, the Supreme Court really considered this case, how it really changed how we were thinking about FAPE for our students and really just that, that data piece and why it's so important. When I was teaching, I worked with students with autism and many of my students did not make the progress that I had hoped from year to year that they might make, but I never pulled over goals from year to year because that's exactly what this Andrew F case was. They were pulling goals over from year to year to year and not using and not looking at their data to say, hey, this guy isn't making the progress he should make. So for me, when I saw that my students weren't making the progress I had hoped necessarily, I was really stopping to look and think about how am I tracking this? What's the level of independence? What, you know, do I need to back up? So just this Q&A document really is, it's, it's a good one. As the Department of Education, we are free to share links and websites, but they're just for information and reference. They are not in any way endorsed by us. None of the data sheets are endorsed by us. We're not saying that one is better than the other. They're just there for you to look at and discard the ones that you don't like, you know, and, and use the ones that you do, okay? All right, this is a feedback document. We are very interested in your feedback. Um, so this is a QR code. You can go on right now and you can grab that with your phone and it will take you to a link which will ask you just a couple of questions. It only takes a few minutes to fill that out. And there's a link there as well. So this will, they'll both take you to the same place and we are very interested in your feedback. We are coming to the end. I think this is even, our, is this our last office hours? I think. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Oh boy, this is our last one. We are starting to put together office hours for next week, uh, for next year, rather, sorry, for next year. Um, so if you have thoughts about things you'd like us to focus on, I'd like to know what those are. Or if there are things, if you've been with us for our office hours this year and you're like, you know what, I really loved this about it, but I didn't like this about it. You know, whatever feedback you have to offer us, we are really interested in it because we do take your feedback. I, I look at this a lot, this form a lot and the information in it and we really take it and um, use it. Well, we use it to to look at our programming. So um, this is our data. So please take a minute to do this. And if you do, you will get a contact hour for today. Uh, these are some of the resources. And actually, I don't think this page is up to, is this page up to date? Yes, it is. Oh, of course it is, Carly, you're so good, thank you. So this actually is up to date. Okay, so these, these links will take you our PD calendar, the second link is where you will find all of our, our recordings, our modules, and all of the uh, PowerPoints that go with it. And then the last three is all to our main DOE special ed page where you can find a variety of resources. And it has been tweaked. It is so much easier to navigate through. It's the, the, the people who put it together did a really great job. And here's our contact information again.
So thank you so much. I'm actually just going to go back to this in case anybody did not grab this. Is there anything in chat, any other questions or anything else that we can answer for people before we give you back eight minutes of your day? Colette, I did just put the link. We do have the Q&A on Friday, but this is our last full um, office hours. And I did just put the registration link for that in the chat box. Okay. Thank you, Julie. Okay. Well, great. All right. Well, if there's nothing else, then I think we'll let you all go. Um, I appreciate you guys jumping on with us today. And if we do not manage to connect with you, I hope you all have a great summer. Summer's coming up. Can you believe it? So thank you all. Thank you, Eric, for joining us. And uh, take care, everyone. Thank you.